Hi, I'm Sean Perrin, and welcome to the Clarinet Podcast, the show where I discuss all that's new and neat with clarinet with the neatest people in the industry. Today's extra neat guest is Laura Campbell, more commonly known as Laura underscore clarinetist. And she is an Instagram sensation from Australia and has a giant audience of over 30,000 adoring fans. Many of those people took the time to send in questions, and today we answer a whole host of listener questions, ranging from Laura's impressive Instagram success, how to make great videos, and how to deal with criticism online. Be sure to tune in next time for part two of today's conversation, which will focus more on clarinet related topics. If you enjoy the show and want free episodes straight to your device, please subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to get access to extended ad-free versions of today's episode and many others while supporting the show at the same time, please visit clarineat.com slash subscribe to become a patron. You'll get immediate access starting at just $1 per month and can cancel anytime. I'd like to give a special shout out here today to new backers Alessandra and Martin. Welcome to the Clarineat family. Don't forget, Clarinet also has a fledgling YouTube channel, and I'm actually giving away something extra special from Bakun at 10,000 subscribers. Here's a hint, it's actually a clarinet. So go on over to youtube.com slash clarinet to become a subscriber because only subscribers will have a chance to win. Again, that's youtube.com slash clarinet. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you especially to our patrons and sponsors for making everything here at Clarinet possible. Imagine a reed that offers complex performance and sound, but is washable, recyclable, consistent, doesn't require moistening, and lasts for months instead of days. It's all possible with Legere Reeds, the world's leading synthetic reed brand made right here in Canada. Legere Reeds are used exclusively by some of the world's greatest clarinetists, including Eddie Daniels, Carada Giuffredi, David Schifrin, and many others. And now, it's your turn. Experience Legere's Reeds at your local music store, or by heading to Legere.com. That's L-E-G-E-R-E dot com. Take your clarinet to the next level with a new mouthpiece, barrel, or bell from Bakun Musical Services. With 14-day trials, free shipping on eligible orders, and expert advice, you can be sure you're making the best choice for your musical needs. For Canadian customers, be sure to check out the new store that allows you to pay in Canadian dollars. And for everyone listening, I have an exclusive coupon for you. You can use code CLARINET at checkout to save 10% on your next accessory purchase at bakunmusical.com. That's code CLARINET at bakunmusical.com. Encoda is a new app that lets you stream, practice, and perform tens of thousands of music scores. It's kind of like Netflix or Spotify, but for sheet music. Get a free trial today. Just search Encoda on your device's app store. That's Encoda, N-K-O-D-A. Laura, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Sean. Thank you for having me. So your followers have been excellent. I love them already because they basically did my work for me today, preparing for today's episode. Um, we've got, I think it was 65 questions. That's excellent. We're going to try and get through as many of them as we can today and uh, do little shout outs here and there. But thank you so much for taking the time to send those in. Laura, if you're ready, I guess we'll just start at the top and start working our way down. Go for it. The first question here that comes in, it's definitely related to your channel. What inspired you to actually play the clarinet instead of other instruments? And this was from Anastasia Corman O'Reilly. <laughs> I actually started the clarinet when I was 12 years old. I was in year seven, which in Australia is your first year of high school. And they had a concert band that all of the year sevens had to go and watch. And I remember they played Wallace and Gromit. Oh, they also played the SpongeBob SquarePants theme song. And I thought it sounded so cool. And I was like, yes, I need to be in the band. That's amazing. And there was a girl that I knew who was playing the clarinet in the band and she had like long blonde hair and I was like, oh, I want to be just like her. And I remember them saying that if you played a big instrument, then you had to keep your instrument in a storage room. But if you played something small like the flute or the clarinet, you could just keep it in your school locker. And so I went, right, I'm playing something small. I want to play the clarinet. So we had to put our preferences in order and I went, I want to play the clarinet then the alto saxophone, and then the flute. And there we go. I started the clarinet, and now I play all three of those instruments, which is super cool. Even if I didn't choose the clarinet, like even if I started on the flute, I would have still fallen in love with music. But Mm. I am really glad that I started on the clarinet because it's definitely my favorite instrument that I play. And it's so easy as a woodwind doubler starting on clarinet because those skills and all of the fingerings, they all transfer over to saxophone and flute and bassoon. So... Yeah, definitely glad I started on clarinet. So this leads right into Halo 2 Girls' question. How long have you played the clarinet for then? How long has it been since that first time? I started in 2009, so 11 years I've been playing for. A lot of people start to play clarinet 
you know, maybe they play in community bands or they play in orchestras or they play wind music or whatever, but, but not all of them start on Instagram. So what led you to start a clarinet Instagram channel? Well, I suppose during high school, I was always watching YouTube and things like that. I was actually really late to get on Instagram. So during high school, I was just watching a lot of YouTube videos. And there's this guy on YouTube called Josh Plotner, and he does these amazing multi-track videos. And I absolutely fell in love with them. I was like, these sound so amazing. I want to learn how to do them. So in high school, I started experimenting with recording clarinet trios and clarinet duets on GarageBand. So I figured out how to, you know, have different voices of audio, but I didn't know how to turn them into videos or anything like that. So I just kind of left it for a few years. And then I finally jumped on Instagram when I was in university and there was this girl named Katie Flute. And she posts the most beautiful pictures of flutes like with gold and like engraving on the lip plates, so beautiful. And I was just scrolling for hours through her page being like, this is so cool. There's a page literally just about the flute and everything is so beautiful. I want to be able to do something like that. So I searched for a page that was like that, but for the clarinet and nothing really existed. There were no clarinet players really on Instagram. And I went, why is that? That's really strange. Maybe I should do that. So I think I started doing it at the end of 2016. I just started uploading a couple pictures of my clarinet and then I was still so interested in making these multi-track videos. And I mentioned it to my teacher, David Griffiths, and he said, oh, like, why don't you try this app called Acapella? And I tried it before, but I didn't really know how to use it. So I got back on it and I a short little multi-track, I think it was the Pretty Little Liars theme song. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. It sounds amazing. And so I uploaded that and it went really well on Instagram. People were loving it. They were like, oh, my God, this is so cool. And I was like, oh, people really like clarinet videos. That's awesome. And then I was just like mucking around at home and I finally learned how to do a gliss. And I was amazed. And so I filmed myself playing the opening of – um. City in blue. And that video got so many likes and comments and I was like, this is crazy. And it just kind of blew up. So then I really love creating these multi-track videos and just videos of me practicing and posting these photos and other people love it as well. So I'm just going to keep on doing it. And yeah, that's kind of where I went from there. So are you the kind of person who's like refreshing your subscriber count every day and worrying about that kind of stuff? Or do you just kind of go with the flow and do it because you love it? Well, when I started it, I had no intention of growing a following at all. I was just doing it because I loved it. I think when I first started, I had something like literally 30 followers. I had like random pictures of food that I cooked and stuff that wasn't related to the clarinet. I've, I've deleted them now, but you can scroll all the way back to the start of my Instagram and I had like the most random photos. But yeah, my goal wasn't to grow my following or anything. But yeah, just got to a point where I'd start getting so many notifications of people liking photos and commenting and following me. And I had to turn off my notifications because it kind of got really crazy and it just started following. And I think other people who are on Instagram can kind of agree, but it's kind of addicting, like watching your followers grow. I think my goal when I started, I said to my dad, I was like, I'd love to have 200 followers. How cool would that be? And then in a couple of months, I got to a thousand followers and it was just crazy. I was like, I'm nothing special. Like in my mind, I'm like, I'm just a girl who plays the clarinet in university. Like I'm not Martin Frost or anything, but people seem to be loving what I'm doing. That's so important, you know, and one of the best things I was ever told about creating online content, especially for a smaller niche, like clarinet is not a huge niche, you know, always imagine a physical space with the number of whatever you're looking for um, to be in. Like, for example, if you were looking for 200 subscribers, like that's a fairly large room, but but now you've got over 30,000, that's a football stadium, you know, so it can help to put that into perspective. And it can even help if you only have small numbers, like if you post a video and it only gets 33 views, I mean, that's still a classroom full of people. So I posted a free lesson this morning on my YouTube channel. And um, within about an hour, it had 168 views already. And I was like, man, I couldn't even have taught that many people if I tried really, 
this morning. And yet I did it from my, my living room, you know, it's amazing. So it's really crazy to visualize it. And I think I, I still can't really realize how many people 30,000 is. That's actually crazy. Like one of my YouTube videos, my most popular YouTube video, which is how to do a gliss on the clarinet, has over 100,000 views. And I actually can't even imagine that many people. It's so crazy to me. Yeah, it's nuts. I, I have a video too. It was one of my junior recital videos and it has, I think, like 200,000 views over the past 10 years or so. And it's crazy because I, I thought about the same thing one day. I counted up the number of listening hours it was. And if I had performed that piece for each person individually over the last 10 years, I would have spent something like, you know, three months solid playing that piece or whatever it happens to be, right? Was it like a turning point where you realized this could take off or did subscribers slowly build over time or how has that kind of been? It's kind of been a little bit on and off. I've had times where it's been growing pretty steadily and then I've had other times where it's been really crazy and going really fast. So on Instagram, you can actually have a look at your analytics and you can see how many followers you're gaining like every week or you're losing and it's really cool. You can kind of see what country all your followers are from. And so there was a point it was about just over a year ago where I was gaining something like 1,700 new followers a week, which it was absolutely crazy. And there's other times where if I don't post, I may, might gain like 100 followers in a week. So th there wasn't like a point where it would kind of just took off. It's just kind of been pretty steady over the last few years. How do you deal with this sort of internet fame type thing? I mean, I, I remember I was at Clarinet Fest one time and, and someone came up and asked me for a picture and that was the first time that it happened and it just never stopped happening all of Clarinet Fest. And the first time I laughed and by the last time I just smiled and was like, I guess that's a thing now. So have you had any of this yet or how do you deal with it? Well, I haven't been to Clarinet Fest or anything like that, so probably not on that kind of scale. One time I went into McDonald's for a coffee and I was just like editing while I was getting new tires or something. And the guy who gave me my coffee said, are you Laura? I watch your videos on Instagram. And I went, what? And he's like, yeah, I play the clarinet at the local high school. I've been watching you for ages. And I was like, that's so crazy that someone just like out in public can recognize who I am. It's really funny, like with my students as well. Whenever I like start at a new school, I don't really tell my students what I do outside of teaching, but they usually kind of figure it out on their own. So I've had my students come into a lesson saying, Miss, I Googled you and I found a video of you playing Bohemian Rhapsody. And it was so <laughs> cool. Like, how do you make those videos? I want to do them too. Oh my God, that's crazy. And, you know, they'll all see that they're watching my Instagram stories, seeing what I'm up to during the day and... Yeah, that's kind of funny as well. I get lots of messages. Like, the amount of messages I get is kind of crazy. It's always at a point where it's overwhelming because I always have over 99 message requests. But I get all these messages saying, Hi, Laura, like, you inspire me so much. I've been watching your videos for years. Like, you're the reason I started clarinet. Or, like, I'd love to meet you one day. Or, you're what's getting me through this really hard time. And it's, it's really crazy to think that I have an impact on these people that I've never even met. Like I've even met up with a few of my followers who live in Melbourne and like had coffee with them and it's been really cool and we've been able to chat as if we're just friends as well, which is, is really cool. I mean, I find with podcasting, it's kind of a lonely thing. Like there's many days where it's just me in my room and, and it's sort of different than when I used to be out freelancing and teaching and encountering, you know, real people. And there's some days where like, it gets kind of like dark and gloomy and I'm just like, oh, I can't create a video today and I'm, no one's really listening or no one cares. Did you ever have these kind of thoughts or is it just me? <laughs> yeah, oh, definitely. I mean, like when I'm recording, I basically just lock myself in this room and I spend hours recording a video and, you know, many times I'll be like, oh, like this intonation is terrible. I need to re-record that. You know, it's so easy as musicians especially to beat ourselves up about our playing. And then when I have to watch myself back playing something, I go, oh, like, you know, I played a wrong note or this didn't sound great. My tone could be better here. So it's a very lonely thing. And so it's really cool when I get a really lovely message saying, hey, I love this video. Like this really inspired me. It can just really improve your mood. So let's dive back into this sort of element of being a creator. Like, let's say that I have a social media channel, which I do. How would I go about growing my following? And what are some strategies that you use to do this? 
I'll stick to talking about Instagram because I feel like that's kind of my thing. But on Instagram, I've been really careful to make sure that I have my niche. So my niche is just the clarinet. Anything that I post on my page is about the clarinet. So I've seen some people who have tried to grow their following and they'll post about the the clarinet, so I might follow them. But then if they post a picture, for example, of their dog or of their coffee, then I'll go, oh, well, that's not why I'm following you. So then I might follow them. So I make sure that every post that I do is sticking to the clarinet. If you really want to grow quicker, it's all about being really consistent about when you're uploading as well. So I find that if I upload every single day for a week, then my following will just start growing even more. Or you could choose I'm only going to upload once a week or every second day or whatever, but you need to find what is a good schedule for you and you've got to stick with that which is really hard. For me, I could be like, okay, I know that I should be uploading every day, but I might get really busy with performing and teaching and then have a couple of weeks off and I'll feel really guilty about that. Um, when I was starting, it was really useful as well. I like did a Google search on how to grow an Instagram page because I had absolutely no clue on what a hashtag was or how to use Instagram at all. But using the hashtags is really, really helpful and make sure they're relevant to what you're posting. So I always use like hashtag clarinet, clarinetist, music, woodwind, whatever's relevant because then people like me, I'll be like, hey, I want to see all these clarinet related things on Instagram and I'll click on the hashtag clarinet and I'll just scroll through and see all these really cool clarinet videos. So that's really helpful. You can comment on other people's posts. So, for example, if there was another clarinet player or flute player that I really loved listening to on Instagram, I might comment on their post and be like, hey, I love your video so much. Like, how did you do this? Or I really love this piece or I love your tone here. Something really meaningful Um, and that will really help. It's really funny watching some pages try to grow and they're doing it the incorrect way. I get a lot of messages saying, hi, I'm so-and-so and and I would love if you could subscribe to my YouTube channel. And I'm kind of like, well, you haven't given me a reason to subscribe to your YouTube channel. You're not giving me any benefits. If you said, hey, I'm doing this thing on the clarinet, I think you'd really enjoy it. I don't know, give me a reason to go subscribe to your YouTube channel. Or don't just say, can you follow me back? Like, why? That's not the right way to do it, asking people to just follow you. You need to give them something in return. So what I'm giving to my followers is entertainment on the clarinet or knowledge. I might be teaching someone like how to get a better tone, something like that. That's what I'm giving to my audience. So you need to be able to provide a purpose of some sort. So you mentioned trying to post often. Are you using a scheduling app or do you try to actually sit down and post every day manually or how are you doing that? I don't actually use a scheduling app. I found the best time for me to post. For me, that's like as soon as I wake up in the morning, that's when most of my followers are online. Um, I found that out just through looking at my analytics on Instagram, but I don't use a scheduling app. I tried it for a little bit. when I, I've gone overseas a couple of times. When I went to Italy a few years ago, I used a scheduling app just because the best time to upload was when I was asleep. Or there were times where I experimented with uploading at midnight. So then I would schedule it, but I don't actually use a scheduling app. I just do it all manually. So next, let's get into the nitty gritty of actually doing the multi-track videos for a minute. So this question is from Marja Lurg. I'd love a dummy's guide to multi-track recording. I have so many duets I want to play with myself. How would you work on that and what sort of equipment would you use? Yeah, I get a lot of questions on how to create these videos. That's one of my most asked questions and it's kind of a pretty long answer. As far as if you're wanting to do it at home and you're just getting started, the Acapella app is a really fantastic place to start. So you can just record each part and they use the video from when you're recording it and that's just the quickest way to make these videos using the Acapella app. So that's what I was using for basically my first couple of years on Instagram, everything was through the acapella app. But then it ended up getting really tricky because I'd want to record Bohemian Rhapsody, for example, which goes for ages. And so if I'd get to the very end of a piece and I'd make a mistake, I'd have to record the whole part again. So it'd get really frustrating. 
um, and the sound quality wasn't fantastic either. Sometimes I still do record on the Acapella app, but the audio quality, if I just use my iPhone mic or the microphone from my earphones, with the clarinet especially, it can sound really distorted. So I actually have this microphone, it's called a Zoom IQ7, and it plugs into my iPhone, um, and it has like really good audio. And then a couple of years ago, I decided I wasn't going to use Acapella app anymore because it was getting too frustrating, and I wanted to figure out how to make my videos of a much higher quality. And I had no clue about video editing or audio recording at all, so I had to do a lot of research. There's this girl on Instagram called Jean Luciani, and she's a flute player. And she is probably one of the main people who also inspired me to do multi tracks. Hers are just, they sound so beautiful. But I sent her a message and I said, Hey, Gina, like, how do you record your multi track videos? I've been wanting to do it for ages, but I'm just not sure what programs I should be using, what kind of microphones are great. And she recommended using, um, I think it was Adobe Premiere to edit my videos. So I went out and I bought a professional microphone. I bought a Rode NT1A microphone and I bought an interface. So assuming that a lot of people that are listening don't know what an interface is, an interface, it connects the microphone to your laptop, basically. It like goes in between the microphone and your computer. So I bought an interface and I actually started recording just on GarageBand. So if you don't want to go out and buy these really expensive programs, you can literally just start recording your audio on GarageBand. So I do the audio separately to the video. I think a lot of people think I record them same time, but I'm kind of creating a music video. The audio I record completely separately. I don't use GarageBand anymore. I use Logic Pro, which is like the professional version of GarageBand. You can use like whatever kind of audio recording software you want, um, but that's just one that works for me. I like the layout. It's easy to use. So I use Logic Pro and then I export the audio and then I create the video separately. I actually don't have a professional camera or anything. I record all of my videos just on my iPhone. So I record the videos and then I put them into my laptop and I just edit the video in Adobe Premiere. And that's how I create them. I had to do a lot of searching on YouTube and Google on, you know, how to edit these videos, how to get all these different boxes of the videos into one space. And it was a lot of experimenting and a lot of frustration, but finally figured it out. That's really fascinating. I had no idea that you actually don't record the audio with the video. When did you realize that was a better idea to do than, than trying to sync it all together? Was that when you dropped a cappella or... In acapella, you record the audio and the video at the same time. But if you want to be able to make it a higher quality, there's really no option to be able to do the audio and the video at the same time. Whilst if I'm doing the audio separately, then that means, you know, if I do a take of a really long piece and I just need to fix up that one bar, then I can. I don't need to record the whole track again. So it makes it a lot quicker. I remember when I started, when I recorded Bohemian Rhapsody, it took me a whole day to record it. I think I was in my bedroom for about eight hours recording Bohemian Rhapsody when I did it on the acapella app. And then I re-recorded it, I think, a year or two ago. And it only took me a couple of hours because it was a lot quicker. I didn't have to redo a whole take if I made one mistake. I could just edit one particular bar if I had to. So much easier and so much less frustrating. So sort of a follow up question to all this, I guess, would be like, how do you deal with advancements in technology or like new features on Instagram? Like I remember when stories came out for me, I just wasn't interested in it. And I've done a horrible job of using it. And I still am not interested in it. I'm still not doing a good job. So like, do you have trouble adapting when the new change comes or new software? Or do you just kind of go with it? Or what's it like? I love experimenting with all the new stuff that comes out. I think it's really important that we all have a go at all of the new things. There's a guy, I don't know if you've heard of him, called Gary Vaynerchuk. And he is this massive entrepreneur and he is a king at social media. And he's really inspirational. I have a couple of his books. But he talks about how you need to just have a go at everything. 
you know, and there's no point in me just sticking with Instagram. It's so important for me to have a go at TikTok and YouTube, for example, because if one day Instagram shuts down, then the page is gone, right? So it's so important that I have a go at all of these other little things. You're right. I mean, even Facebook, I spent a lot of time building a Facebook following and it peaked around 3000 people shortly after I started. And then it hasn't really gone anywhere. And I think it's partly because people just aren't into Facebook and Facebook is so saturated with stuff from family and all this. There's a lot of crap on Facebook, let's be honest, but people don't follow pages on there anymore, you know? Yeah, I suppose each different social media platform kind of has its own purpose now. So Instagram for me is where people go there to be able to look at their niche, look at things that they're actually interested in. I can go on Instagram and I can be like, right now I feel like seeing pictures of puppies and I can literally go on there and scroll through pictures of puppies for hours. That's why I go on Instagram. Facebook is completely different. I am not massive into Facebook. I do have a Facebook page, but I don't really use it. Facebook for me is yeah, just more about staying in touch with friends and family. And then you have YouTube, which for me is about learning how to do things. So I'll put my vlogs up on YouTube. I'll put videos on how to look after your reads, things like that. And then now we have TikTok, which is completely different. And that's just about funny videos and entertainment. So yeah, it's been so important for me to make sure that I'm jumping on all of these different platforms rather than sticking to the one. And even on like Instagram, for example, jumping on stories or using the new features that they have on stories, like how people can ask you a question or you can do a poll or you can do Instagram lives. I just love experimenting with all the new features. So what do you think's next then? Is it TikTok? Yeah, get on TikTok if you can. <laughs> it's really addicting. You can just scroll through it for hours and hours, but it's very different from Instagram because the kind of content that I'm looking at isn't just clarinet related. So it's very different. So this next question is from underscore Moser Daniel, but this one is something that I've encountered too. Like there's always some clown or some troll that comes along and kind of tries to ruin your day. But he says, how do you deal with people telling you that you shouldn't record pop music or any other negative comments that you receive? Yeah, it's really tricky to deal with a lot of negative feedback that you get. I think that comment um, in particular was because I posted on my story yesterday that I had this song called Dance Monkey that I recorded about six months ago and I never ended up posting it, um, not because of a follower, but because someone in my life told me that if I uploaded a pop song that no one would take me seriously. And it's really hard to get past that, I suppose. I remember when I started on Instagram, there were two girls who were commenting on my photos and saying, oh, I can't believe she would just post a video of a clarinet with a flower. That's so stupid. Who would enjoy stuff like that? And even on my videos, you know, I can get like, you suck or like, this is so out of tune. I um, actually posted me playing a small section of the Mozart concerto on my page about a month ago because I was preparing for an audition and someone commented, you really need to listen back to it because it's actually really not that great. I don't know why you're getting so much positive feedback because you really need to listen back to it and prove your listening skills. And I was like, oh, okay, thanks for your feedback. <laughs> it's really tricky, but I always think it's so important to remember that I would never go on someone's page and leave a negative comment. I would never go to someone and say, hey, you're really bad at tonguing, you should quit the clarinet. You know, If someone's leaving a comment like that, then clearly they're hurting themselves, like they're feeling not great on the inside. So it actually doesn't have a lot to do with you. But yeah, sometimes if I do receive a negative comment, it's really hard to deal with and you do take it personally 100%. It's hard not to, Yeah. you know, because usually they are personal attacks. But, you know, I think it's important to share the process, right? Like even the greatest players in the world didn't go from, you know, zero to what they are now without that process. But the thing about Instagram and social media and all this is it's exposing the process a lot more, you know? Like I, I'm sure that a lot of these, you know, world-class clarinetists that we never heard until they were absolutely amazing, they had all these intermediate steps. And I think that's why people really love social media is you kind of get an inside look at what people are doing and they realize it's okay to make mistakes or not always sound perfect or play a pop song for fun or whatever. And we don't see that in the music education system. It's always just this polished, 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 you should almost feel guilty if you make a mistake kind of thing. So 
Yeah, I wonder if that's part of it, like the sort of the raw nature and the, you know, being real with people. Yeah, well, I make it really clear to everyone that, you know, I don't have a professional job in an orchestra. I just graduated from uni a couple of years ago. I'm just a woodwind teacher. I make it very clear that I'm not uploading perfect, you know, performances of anything. And But I think that's why people enjoy it. They can see the process. I can say, hey, guys, like here's me playing this part of the Mozart. Here's what I'm really struggling with and here's how I fix that issue. So, you know, I'm just being really honest about the fact that I am struggling with these things too. You know, there are pages out there of people who are posting things only when they feel like it's exactly perfect. But it's really hard to relate to that kind of content because you can't see the things that they've struggled with and how they fixed all these little issues. This is actually a psychological phenomenon too. Like if you watch two identical lectures and one person is like prim and proper the whole time and one person at the beginning makes a little mistake or spills some coffee on themselves or whatever and laughs about it, you'll actually find the second person more likable and relatable, even if it's exactly the same stuff. I can relate to this exactly. Back in 2007, I think it was, I uploaded a recital on YouTube and I asked on the clarinet bulletin board at the time, like, hey, can you know people critique this? And And someone commented like, oh, you know, this is just not ready yet. Why would you share this? Make sure you delete this before you try to apply for a job one day. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I literally asked for feedback. And if it wasn't ready enough to play for the concert, like I kind of just saw YouTube as an extension of the concert hall. Like now someone else can see it. You know, I just, I couldn't understand or relate and uh, it just made no sense. So you just have to disregard these people, I think. And it's a good way to, you know, live your life. (laughs) Yeah. And it's a really good point of saying, you know, how like you can look back Like I've still got things on my YouTube channel and on Instagram from when I was in uni. I even put up a post last week of me playing the clarinet when I was literally in high school and it sounded shocking, but it's really cool because I can scroll back and I can see what I sounded like a few years ago and I can compare to where I am now so I can really see that difference. You know, I'm not keeping things up there to say, oh, I'm perfect at the clarinet and here's a perfect performance of the Brahms sonata. It's just really cool to go back and say, hey, this is what I sounded like three years ago and I can see that I've made a lot of progress since then. So this next question, uh, there's a couple left here and then we're going to take a break and move on to part two. Um, This question is from NYC Clarinet. She says, if you're comfortable discussing it, I'd love to hear about the various ways you make money online. And so I guess she sort of means like income streams. Uh, I've talked about a lot before, but like a portfolio career and uh, all that kind of stuff. So I just wonder if you could delve into that a little bit. Yeah. Um, Well, Instagram is really different to YouTube. On YouTube, I've made a very small amount of money. I think I got my first paycheck from YouTube like a month ago and it was like $100, but that was like over six months I earned $100 or something. But Instagram is really different because Instagram doesn't actually pay people. So the way that you kind of earn money on Instagram is by working with brands. But I actually haven't made any money at all through Instagram, like no one has paid money into my bank account, but I have gotten a lot of free things, which I suppose is kind of how I earn money on Instagram. So I work with brands. I actually haven't worked with a lot of brands because I make sure I only work with people that I really, really love because if I'm promoting a product to someone, I don't want to promote something that I actually wouldn't use. So there's actually only a small number of brands that I've worked with, but yeah, they send me free content. It's really cool working with them. I think the first brand I ever worked with was Beaumont Music. I've only been doing Instagram for six months and all that they did was they sent me a couple of free clarinet swabs and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. There was no no contract involved, no money. They just sent me some some free cleaning cloths and I didn't have to do anything in return, but I did a post saying, hey, thanks for these cloths. I think they're awesome. So I think that for those listening, this might surprise them because I think that people see people online and if they're successful with their following, they just suddenly assume that they're loaded from doing that, you know? So do you think it would surprise your listeners that, you know, um, you don't drive a Rolls Royce and this is, (laughs) you know? I'm just a normal human with a normal job. The way that I earn my living is through woodman teaching. I don't really earn any money at all through doing Instagram. It's just completely for fun and it takes a lot of time and sometimes I do pour a lot of money into it. Like I used to go out and get costumes for my videos and I have all of these expensive recording equipment, but I don't actually earn money from Instagram. 
So what about people who want to support you, though? Like, I imagine that a lot of your followers, like, let's say even 1% of your followers would pitch in a dollar or two a month for some bonus content or something. Would you consider starting a Patreon or something like that? Or Yeah, I do already have a Patreon. I don't know. For me, I feel guilty asking for money from my followers, which is really funny because I, you know, I spend hours and hours creating this content and then I feel guilty asking people to, you know, give me a few dollars to receive some extra content. So I do have a Patreon. Yeah, that's probably the best place you can support me. Otherwise, I have my YouTube channel and that's about it. So there it is, people. I think that, you know, if you are enjoying Laura's content, you want more of it, you want to help support what she's doing, uh, I think you should check out her Patreon. I know that I'm going to actually go right after this and and pitch in. I didn't realize that she had a Patreon yet. So that's something that I will be doing right away. So Laura, there's a couple more questions here real quick. Let's go through these and then we will jump on to part two. So maybe this will be the last one here. What is your favorite video that you ever recorded? And this question is from maybe a fan of yours called underscore Laura World. <laughs> My favorite one that I ever recorded, I recorded this in January. I did a cover of the Batman theme by Danny Elfman. Danny Elfman was my favorite composer ever in high school to the point I was so obsessed. I did a video presentation on him. I went to go see him when he played in Sydney. So I did a multi-track of the Batman theme with, I think, 20 different parts. I had bass clarinet, clarinet, E-flat clarinet, flute, piccolo, and alto saxophone. It took me about 10 hours to edit that video, even though it's only a one minute long video. But that is my favorite one that I've ever created. I don't think so many people realize how much time goes into this stuff. You know, they're just scrolling through Instagram and they see a quick, you know, clip and they're like, oh, that was fun. And they move on. But like, it's so much work. Yeah. I'm starting a at the moment called the virtual concert band because all of the schools are closed at the moment I wanted a way for musicians to be able to come together and play in an ensemble so I've created the virtual concert band where I've sent sheet music out and people are sending in recordings of them playing it and I am about to start the editing process of that tonight and I'm a little bit scared about how many hours that's going to take but uh, the final product is always worth it. I love it. Well, be sure to check out Laura's Instagram at Laura underscore clarinetist. And don't forget, we just talked about the Patreon too. So patreon.com slash Laura clarinetist. And um, I hope to see you in part two of this conversation. We're going to dive into some of the things that Laura loves about teaching. And we're also going to feature the extended lightning round, which is what my patrons on Patreon get access to. And if you're enjoying the Clarinet show as well, you can check that out at patreon.com slash clarinet to subscribe to the extended edition or access the free one at clarinet.com and listen wherever you get your podcasts. So thank you so much, Laura, for coming on the show, and I will see you next time. Thank you so much for listening to the Claire Neat Podcast. If you'd like to send me a guest suggestion, have some feedback, or just want to say hi, you can leave me a voicemail, an email, or actually book an online lesson at clarineat.com. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And to learn more about the Bakun clarinet giveaway when it becomes available and to be entered, head to youtube.com slash clarinet to subscribe right now. And if you listened all the way to the end, you are a true fan and you are awesome. But don't forget there's more to many episodes at clarinet.com slash subscribe. You can get immediate access for as little as $1 per month to ad-free extended episodes. And a little treat is that I also upload there at a higher audio quality. And you can still listen in your favorite podcast player. To learn more, again, that's clarinet.com slash subscribe. Thank you again to our sponsors. We've got Encoda. It's kind of like Netflix or Spotify, but for sheet music. And you can check them out for a free trial at encoda.com. That's N-K-O-D-A dot com. We also, of course, have Bakun Musical Services. If you're listening to this in the month of April 2020, you might be interested to know that they're actually having their spring cleaning sale and there's some really good deals going on in there. So also, any time of the year, you can use your Clarinet coupon code. That's C-L-A-R-I-N-E-A-T if you haven't figured that out already. Uh, but you can use that at checkout for 10% off any accessory purchase that is year round and ongoing. And last but not least, of course, we have Legere Reads. And I'm always talking about how much I love this product, but they actually are truly amazing. Another amazing thing is they're actually made right here in Canada. So check them out at your local music store, or you can head to Legere.com. That's L-E-G-E-R-E.com. If you want to use a read that's not only consistent, but washable and a very fantastic playing product. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. And I look forward to seeing you next time for part two with Laura Campbell.